Good morning, everyone. We're good. Yeah, I was hoping the daylight savings time would throw people off, but, or perhaps it did. And you think, I'm John Mackey, and uh, so if you're here for somebody else, you're just uh, probably too late for that, or too early. And I've been on this book tour talking about conscious capitalism, and I've done it so many times now, I've realized I don't need to do a PowerPoint, I don't need to do multimedia, so if you're looking for the electronic show, you're not gonna get that either. But what I think I can do is talk for, pace and talk for 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. So, um, maybe I'll just start out by sort of confessing that while I am progressive in many ways, I am a complete devout capitalist. I completely believe in capitalism. And I do so because I'm a student of history. I've seen how far humanity has come. Most people are not well informed about history. They're not well informed about how humanity has lived through most of time. We have, many people are romantics. They have a, a romantic belief about how human beings used to be when we were closer to nature and uh, we were in sync with it, and, but people are just not well informed. And as we did research for our book, we made a lot of very interesting discoveries that sort of blew my mind. First of all, capitalism has only been around a couple of hundred years. Now, of course, business has been around since forever, probably. Humans have been trading with each other. We're, we are a species who creates things and then exchanges our creations with other people. So that's been around, but capitalism itself has only been around a little over 200 years. And so we found some interesting statistics out. 200 years ago, 85% of everyone alive on the planet Earth lived on less than $1 a day. Now we have a lot of concern about inequality in our society. And we used to live in a society that had very little inequality meaning because everybody was poor. 90% of the people were dirt poor. And uh, of course there was an elite, the aristocracy that uh, owned the land and, and everybody else was peasants and serfs and basically very, very poor. And what is that percentage now? We've gone from 85% of people living on less than a dollar a day down to just 16%. So we've, we've decreased abject poverty if using that $1 a day uh, measurement, and these are in today's dollars, from 85% to 16%. How about illiteracy? What was illiteracy like 200 years ago before capitalism was invented? Illiteracy rates over 90%. 90% of the people could not read on this planet. How about today? What is that at now? Illiteracy rates now are down to about 14%. How about, um, how about longevity? What was longevity like if you'd lived 200 years ago? Well, I will tell you, longevity 200 years ago was the same as it had been in the previous 40,000 years, meaning people lived to be about 30. That was the average lifespan. What is it today? Today, longevity's increased to 68 across the planet. It's 78 in the United States. It's almost 82 in Japan, which is the longest lived nation. In category after category, in the year zero, the GDP per capita was $467. So a little more, a little more than a dollar a day uh, across the entire world. What was it 1,000 years later? It had dropped. It had dropped down to $453 per capita per year. So we oftentimes, the media will talk about a lost decade, like Japan has had a lost decade or two. Maybe the United States is moving into a, a lost decade. But humanity had a lost millennium. In fact, it had a lot more than a lost millennium because we didn't really begin to see that GDP go up very much until around the year 1800. And then it has gone straight up. And with it, the GDP per capita now in the world is over $7,000. So, 
capitalism combined with the Industrial Revolution has revolutionized humanity in numerous aspects. Are there problems with it? Of course. It's not perfect. But any type of objective, fair-minded study of history will show that capitalism itself has been this amazing system that has lifted humanity up. Unfortunately, oh, and you, can, you can also argue that perhaps the 20th century will be viewed in retrospect as a century where there was this great battle that was fought between two ideologies. One, freedom and capitalism against communism, socialism, and government control. And by every objective measurement, capitalism won that battle. I mean, the United States far outperformed the Soviet Union. South Korea outperformed North Korea. West Germany outperformed East Germany. In every example, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, they outperformed communist China. In almost every objective measurement, again, capitalism won. And yet capitalism is hated. Business is hated. The approval rate of big business in America in 2009 was 16%. Congress had an approval rating of 17%. <laughs> These are the two most despised institutions in America. They are. Statistically speaking, Gallup shows that the two least trusted institutions in America are big business and Congress. And every year, they battle with each other for who will be the most despised. Business has pulled two percentage points ahead in 2012, but they're still looking at about a, under 20% approval rating. That means 81% of the people don't approve of big business. Big business is seen as fundamentally greedy and selfish, exploitative, completely untrustworthy. Or, or as I like to say, capitalism won the battle of the 20th century by any objective measurement, but it failed to capture the minds of the intellectuals or the hearts of the people. In fact, the intellectuals have always hated business, and they've always hated capitalism. If, you will st if you're a stu student of history, if you study history, you'll see that with almost no exceptions, the elites and the intellectuals don't like business. They don't like business people. They're a bunch of money grubbers. All they care about is money. All they care about is profit. They don't care about people. Um, you can see this particularly ha uh, play out because much of business has been done through the ages by minorities. For example, in the West, the Jews did most of the money lending. They were the retailers. They were the middlemen. They were the business. They were the traders. And they were also routinely persecuted and driven out of country after country. The same thing happened in the East. That's what happened to China. The Chinese would migrate or immigrate into societies like Thailand and Korea and Malaysia, Indonesia. They were hated. They were driven out. They were persecuted. And as the Jews and the Chinese were persecuted, their wealth would be routinely confiscated by the elites, and they'd have to start over again. So it's an interesting question to why the intellectuals hate business, but they do. They hate it today. They hated it yesterday. They hated it in the far past. And I have a sneaky suspicion they will hate it in the future as well. Um, by the way, whenever I do this talk, um, I always have somebody come out afterwards to sit and look at me with their arms crossed. I'm an intellectual, and I don't hate business. But if I ask them a few questions, I pretty much just determine that they really don't like business very much. They certainly don't trust it. Um, so we have this paradox that business and capitalism have helped lift humanity up. We have, we've, we're eliminating poverty. We're extending the lifespan. We're creating these amazing products, services that are, that are it's just astounding what we can do today. Um, and humanity is rapidly evolving. I mean, here's some statistics that just sort of blow me away. But let's just look how much progress humanity has made uh, from an evolutionary standpoint in the last 150 years. Consider the fact that 150 years ago, 14 of the 29 states 
in our country had legalized slavery. Just 150 years ago. Yeah. I'm almost been alive half of that time. I'm not quite that old, but I'm moving up there. Um, 100 years ago, there were no democracies, no universal democracy anywhere in the world. Zero. None. Zippo. Why? Because women weren't allowed to vote. Did you realize that? Women didn't, they couldn't vote in America 100 years ago. Today, 58% of everyone alive lives in a universal democracy. We've gone from zero to 58% in just the last 100 years. 75 years ago, the world was basically ruled in these great colonial empires, like the British Empire, the Russian Empire, the French Empire, the German Empire, the American Empire. Um, and that's, for the most part, no longer true. We live, now live in a world of nation states. Um, 100 years ago, do you know how many people graduated from high school in America 100 years ago? 9%. 9% of adults had a high school degree 100 years ago. How many went, graduated from college? 3%. So what is that today? Well, now 85% of American adults have a high school degree, and almost 40% have college degrees. Oh, and by the way, talk about how the world is evolving. The most astounding statistics in my mind are what's happening with women. Consider the fact that 60% uh, of all the people in college now are women. Men are down to 40%. Even more astounding, 70% of all the people in graduate school are women. Women are systematically taking over all the professions, or almost all the professions. They are taking over medicine. They are taking over law. They are taking over education. They are taking over accounting. The only things they haven't taken over yet or, or, or have a long way to go, are um, engineering and the military. Those could be the last two dominoes to fall. But we're rapidly evolving, and our consciousness is evolving. Um, 50 years ago, segregation, the Jim Crow laws were still in effect in half of the United States. This is in my lifetime. I grew up in, a, in, a, in an era where you had different bathrooms and different water fountains and different places people had this Jim Crow segregated society. Obviously the same thing was true in South Africa because apartheid was still in effect. 50 years ago there was no environmental consciousness. There's almost none. It was not a mass phenomenon. Rachel Carson's book Silent Spring is oftentimes identified as what unleashed the environmental revolution and that was printed in, or published in 1962, so 51 years ago. 25 years ago People still thought communism was a, half the human population lived or, uh, under a communist type of, uh, of realms. And that's you know, virtually completely disappeared in the last 25 years. It's astounding. Look at the technology changes that have occurred. I mean, the airplane is only 120 years old. Automobiles only a little bit longer than that. But even in the last, I mean, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there was no World Wide Web. How many people were using a smartphone 15 years ago? That's the biggest change I noticed on college campuses when I walk around. Everybody is looking at their, their smartphones while they're walking around. It's astounding. It used to be guys looked at the girls. <laughs> now they're looking at their phones, but possibly still looking at the girls, but in a digi digitized form. Um, 15 years ago, nobody was using Google. Google didn't exist 15 years ago. How many people in the last 24 hours have Googled something? Raise your hand. It's amazing, isn't it? Facebook. Anybody on Facebook 15 years ago? You weren't on Facebook 15 years ago. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're, you're partly paying attention. <laughs> So anyway, huge evolution has occurred. But what's not evolved and needs to evolve is business. Business has got to evolve. We've got to reposition. Capitalism, I'll say it, it's under attack. And business is under attack in our society. American prosperity is on decline. 
The, for most of the history of the United States, by the way, we were so poor 200 years ago, people came over here because there were opportunities and they had economic freedom. Uh, and they were, we were lightly taxed. But, uh, so I'd say for at least 100 years, the United States was the most economically free nation in the world. In as short a period of time now is just the year 2000, just 13 years ago, we still were number three in the world in economic freedom behind uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. They pulled ahead of us, and those are very dynamic economies. Where do we rank today? We've fallen all the way to number 18. In just the past 12 years, because these are 2012 statistics, we had fallen from number three in economic freedom to number 18. Now, if you want to know why unemployment is still at 7.7%, and it's really higher than that if you want to count all the people that stopped looking for work and have gone out of the workforce. I think the government cooks the books there. Um, if you want to know why per capita income has declined over 10% in the last decade, you don't need to look any further than that statistic that we rank number 18 in the world in economic freedom. As economic freedom declines in America, so does our prosperity. Why is it declining? It's declining because, anybody see the documentary that uh, came out a few years ago called The Corporation? Anybody see that? A few people? Actually, I'm not recommending it. Uh, because corporations in there, are, though, they're portrayed as sociopaths. The corporations are fundamentally these monsters. They're just a bunch of greedy, selfish bastards running around taking all the money and uh, dumping their toxic chemicals in the rivers, and uh, we've got to control that, right? If corporations are sociopaths, we need a really, really powerful government to slow that down or, or, or cage it up. Hence, big businesses' approval rating in, in less than 20%. So, so here's the paradox. Capitalism has done all these wonderful things to help Business has done all these wonderful things, and yet it's distrusted. It has a very low approval rating. And in a sense, we've written the book, Conscious Capitalism, and my talk today is about what we can do about that. Because humanity is evolving, and I've given a lot of interesting statistics to show how it is evolving. We are moving up. We are progressing. And yet, uh, our prosperity is in decline, our unemployment's up, and our economic freedom is in retreat. And it is because business is fundamentally disliked, it is not trusted, and to a certain extent it deserves not to be trusted. Business is oftentimes judged by its worst practitioners, the, the Enrons and the WorldComs and the Bernie Madoffs and the Wall Street banks. That's how business is seen by most people as the worst, the worst practitioners are the ones that, that define the whole cohort of business. I would say that, and that's partly due to the intellectual dislike of business, but um, a part of it's the fact that uh, no, no, other, no other profession in our society is judged by its worst practitioners. If a doctor takes out the wrong kidney, that's seldom on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, if a journalist makes up something, makes up some statistics, or smears somebody, like me, for example, um, that's seldom seen as something that's bad, and all journalism is not, is not judged by the, the basis of that. So, but business is. So business has this terrible reputation problem. And so we've written the book, Conscious Capitalism. We started a movement. You can see our website, consciouscapitalism.org, uh, on the web. When you, when you get off Facebook, you can, uh, <laughs> or you can Google that. So business has this terrible reputation, and we've done this book, and we've written this movement because we want to get people, we want to change the narrative about business. We want people to think differently about business, and we want business to be engaged at differently. Because as good as business has been, as much as capitalism has helped lift humanity up, um, it could be so much better. Business has such incredible potential. People don't aspire to be business people. I don't know, I go speak at business schools all the time. And 
one of the things I commonly hear is, well, you know, I thought about doing a nonprofit organization, but at the end of the day, I sold out, went to business school. And that's how they see themselves, as basically selling out, that they're going into business instead of doing something good in the world. And people oftentimes see the nonprofit sector and government as and government service is good because it's not based on profit. It's not selfish. It's not greedy. It's altruistic. And so we've got this big wall that separates these out. And yet business has the greatest potential in the world to help people. Business is the greatest creator of value in the world. And business doesn't create value for just a few people. Or as we, like, we say in the Conscious Capitalism Credo, business is fundamentally good because it creates value, not for a few, but for everyone that exchanges with it. Business is fundamentally ethical because it's based on voluntary exchange. No one has to trade, for example, with Whole Foods Market. People do, we have lots of competitors. Uh, people do so because it's in their, their best interest to do so. Business is fundamentally noble because it elevates humanity, or it can elevate humanity, and business is fundamentally heroic because it ends poverty and it creates prosperity. So it's good, it's ethical, it's noble and it's heroic, and we want people to see this. So we have to change this narrative, and we change this narrative by making people more conscious of four things. The first is every business has the potential to have a higher purpose besides just making money. Not that there's anything wrong with making money. Um, making money is, is good. And, uh, uh, my body, for example, produces red blood cells. If I stop producing red blood cells, I'm a dead man. But the purpose of my life is not to produce red blood cells. And similarly, business can't exist unless it's profitable. But that doesn't necessarily mean that its purpose is just to make money. Instead, every business has the potential for a higher purpose beyond making money. Uh, pretty much anything that, that inspires humanity to the highest level in art, for example, or philosophy or religion, potentially applies to business as well. As Plato put it, the good, the true, and the beautiful are high ideals that hu humans aspire to. You can aspire to those things in business as well. There's no inherent reason why you cannot. Business needs to be a fully human activity. So the first thing is the creation of more conscious businesses is first business has to discover what its higher purpose is. Why does it exist? What value is it creating in this world? And until business discovers that, uh, you know, and what most entrepreneurs get that. I have known hundreds of entrepreneurs in my life, with only a few exceptions, when I ask them what drives them, do they say, man, I just want to get rich. Yeah, of course, they, they want to make money. But that's not what drives most entrepreneurs. It's not what drove me. And it's not what I got to talk with Bill Gates. It's not what drove Bill Gates. And he's the richest guy in the world. What drives most entrepreneurs is they have some kind of dream, some kind of passion something they want to realize in the world. They're highly creative individuals, every bit as creative as an artist is, uh, or a musician, or a filmmaker. Because entrepreneurs are inherently creative people, and they are in some pursuit of some type of dream. So their business from the very beginning had sort of a, uh, a higher purpose to it, only they seldom make it explicit. They, it stays tacit, so you have to articulate what that higher purpose in a business is. Well, let's give some examples. Um, Google, one of my favorite companies, um, uh, they have a very explicit higher purpose to, to organize the world's information and make it readily accessible. And as, as the founders, uh, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Sir, uh, Brin say, how can that not get you excited? Indeed, how can that not get you excited? How about REI? What's the purpose of REI? To reconnect people with nature, to get people back into nature and reconnect with it. What about Southwest Airlines? Giving people the freedom to fly. Um, 
Whole Foods Market. Uh, our slogan is Whole Foods, Whole People, Whole Planet. But there's a lot of layers to that, to that purpose. And usually the way I say, when we started Whole Foods Market, when my fellow entrepreneurs and I started it, our higher purpose was we wanted to sell healthy food to people, earn a living, have fun. And all three of those things still exist. But now our higher purpose has evolved. It's gotten more complex. And there are a number of different things we're trying to accomplish in the world now. But I oftentimes will articulate it as, we're trying to help heal America. America is sick, people. We are 69% overweight. We are 36% obese. 80% of the money we spend on healthcare dollars in America are for diseases you probably should never get. People should not get heart disease. They should not get type 2 diabetes. They should not get autoimmune diseases. And I would argue they probably shouldn't get cancer. These correlate so closely to diet and lifestyle. And yet, of course, people do not want to believe this because uh, that means people would be responsible. And that just, uh, that's a very scary thought. No one wants, and I'm not trying to blame anybody. And there are certain other causes besides diet and lifestyle. There's a genetic factor and there are other things. So it's not about judgment. But it is about getting people to realize that you can be incredibly healthy. You can have the most vital, healthy life possible. But it probably means you're going to have to change the way you live. You have to change the what you eat. You have to change your lifestyle. And that's one of Whole Foods' higher purposes. We are trying to help educate people to the principles of healthy eating. And we're trying to sell them the foods that will enable them to reach their full potential. Uh, so business has this potential for higher purpose. And that's the first thing a conscious business does. It discovers or rediscovers its higher purpose and begins to articulate it in the world. Business will never be trusted as long as it talks about maximizing profits. But when it starts talking about creating value, when it starts talking about the higher purpose for why it exists, I mean, all the other professions talk in terms of higher purpose. Doctors are extremely well paid, but I have yet to meet a doctor who told me, you know, I got into medicine, man. You don't see the money you can make as a doctor? I am in it for the money, dude. No, I mean, doctors, they want to heal people. And teachers want to educate. Architects design things. Engineers construct buildings and bridges. I, I've even told journalists they have a higher purpose. They should be revealing the truth to the world. And so many of them went into it, journalism, with that goal originally in mind. But uh, many of them have fallen off that path. Uh, that's another, another story, another day. Uh, so higher purpose. Secondly, business must exist not only to create value for its stockholders, for its investors. Business is the great value creator for everyone that trades with it. And this is what people don't understand. We are so hooked up to sort of this, a win-lose game that is a zero sum. Somebody wins, somebody else loses. Somebody gets rich, somebody else is necessarily poor. The most amazing thing about business and capitalism is it's not a zero sum game. It is a win, 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 win game. And everyone that trades with business does so voluntarily for their own mutual gain. So business creates value for its customers. Let's just take a concrete example, the one I know best, Whole Foods Market. Business creates value for the customers that trade with it. So uh, people come to Whole Foods because of the quality that we have, the services we provide, the ambiance we create in our stores. And they, they trade with us. And if they didn't think it was a good deal, they wouldn't make the trade. So whenever people complain about Whole Foods being too expensive, I always say, well, we're, we're trying to sell the highest quality food possible. And of course, no one has to shop there. But uh, uh, many people do. We did $12 billion in sales in the last 12 months. So clearly, a lot of people find our particular mix acceptable. Every business potentially has to create goods and services that other people want to buy. And they will buy it on a voluntary basis. So we're creating value for all those customers that trade with us. We create value for all of our team members who work for us. I mean, 
no one's a slave that works at Whole Foods Market. They do so because it's the best job they're able to find in terms of our pay, our benefits, our opportunities for advancement, the way they're, the work, the way they're treated in the workplace. We created 77,000 jobs. So we are creating value for our team members. What about our suppliers? Our company has, believe it or not, our company has over 100,000 suppliers. I mean, it's astounding. So I get in these GMO questions later on today about why are you guys spending five years? We've got 100,000 suppliers. It takes a while for people to make these shifts. Um, but all of those suppliers are trading with us because it's in their interest to do so. And so we're creating value for those suppliers. They wouldn't be trading with it. We create value for our investors. We started this company with zero uh, back in, in, uh, in 1978. Today our market cap's, I don't know, $16 billion or something like that. So we've created a great amount of value for our investors. We've created a great value for our communities we've, because uh, businesses are citizens in their communities and Whole Foods has already taken, always taken the, the citizenship uh, uh, responsibility very, very seriously. And so we're very philanthropic, we get involved in our communities, and that's exactly what business should do. Business needs to be socially responsible. And business needs to be environmentally responsible. It needs to be responsible for its impacts. It needs to lessen those impacts. And our, and our company is very dedicated to that as well. So look at the value that's been created there. Our business has created value for customers, for employees, for suppliers, for investors, for our community. We've tried to do it in such a way to minimize our environmental impacts. That is good. That is fundamentally good. And in fact, business is the greatest creator of value in the world, far more than government does, far more than the nonprofit sector does. And done in a conscious way, to create a conscious company and do it in such a way that you're consciously trying to create value for all these stakeholders is fundamentally the most rewarding thing you can do to help humanity to evolve. That's why the subtitle of the book is Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business, because business is fundamentally heroic. It is the value creators. We are the ones, ultimately, that both the nonprofit sector and the business sector are dependent upon, ultimately because business creates the prosperity and the wealth that the other two sectors ultimately depend upon. Thirdly, we've got to have a different kind of leader. Historically, this is the third tenet of conscious capitalism, Historically, most of the people that have been attracted to leadership, the, the motives have been power. Leaders have power, and a lot of people are into power. And so they want to move up the hierarchy, particularly men are. They want to move up the hierarchy so they can be more powerful. And then, I suppose, uh, you get more sex, or you get more money. I don't know. Um, but I do know that whenever we post a job at Whole Foods Market, the men are going for it. Uh, and I don't know if I'll stay on that one or not, but uh, <laughs> besides power, money. People have been attracted to because you're at the top of the hierarchy, you get paid a lot more money. So ambitious people, either power or money, have been the drivers. But what we need in the 21st century in these conscious companies that we're trying to create, we need a different kind of leader. One who's more, who A, has a higher degree of emotional intelligence. B, who's more spiritually awake, more spiritually evolved. C, people that are more servant leaders, that are dedicated to fulfilling the purpose of the company, the higher purpose of the company, and who are there to serve the stakeholders, to consciously create value for all these stakeholders. Um, so now we've, you tie back in personal growth, because as leaders have got to personally grow and evolve. I can tell you at Whole Foods Market that uh, it's, Whole Foods would not be where it was today or is today if I had not personally grown because I held the company back numerous times being not very mature, not that emotionally intelligent, not that spiritually awake. And as I evolved, then every time I could take a step up, the company could go with it. Ultimately, you cannot create a conscious business unless the leadership itself is conscious. You just can't do it. The leadership will, will, will sabotage it, will short circuit it. So it's essential now that we've got to create these conscious businesses that we are also helping our leadership to become more conscious and evolve. Because you evolve not only for yourself, but for your whole organization, if you're a leader of it. 
Fourth, we've got to create cultures that are fundamentally humanistic and empowering. This is the fourth tenet. Um, there are some things that, that w w as we did the research on our book, that we, did, we talked to lots of these other CEOs of these, other co more con these conscious companies that we identified. They have so many things in common. The cultures are remarkably similar. They tend to be, they tend to be more caring. Well, we have a, a, a in, the, in the book we use a, a acronym, tactile, to describe a good culture. So just working down that, the first is trust. T for trust. Conscious businesses have cultures that are fundamental, fundamentally trusting. They, um, they help people feel secure, they trust the people that work there, and they are in turn are trusted by their stakeholders. Um, we have, uh, you move to A, uh, the, these businesses tend to be more authentic, they tend to be more, um, we live in a world today where um, more, almost more than anything, we want people to be authentic. We have a, a, a quest for authenticity because so much of the world is not authentic. I always like to say, in my lifetime, I've never had a president that I ever thought told me the truth. I mean, politicians just routinely lie because they don't think the American people can handle it. They continue to do it. It always amazes me. Um, so, but we live in a world today where all of this stuff can get exposed pretty quickly. So we need authenticity. We need organizations that have cultures that are caring. Caring and loving. You know, think about the metaphors that are often used in business. Business is, uh, it's, they're war metaphors. Let's, we gotta kill those bastards. Uh, let's roll over them. We are gonna crush them. You are so dead, dude. Um, <laughs> Or we got Darwinian metaphors. Only the paranoid survive. This is a just jungle out there. It's a jungle out there. Kill or be killed. Eat or be eaten. And this is the way the, you know, our, the metaphors you use describe your consciousness. It's the way you think about the world. It's the, the mental model that we use. So as a result, care and love are in the closet, largely in corporations. They have not fully awoken. We cannot create organizations that are, that are good cultured organizations that allow humans to fully flourish until love and care come out of the closet. Now, one of the great things, of course, is that women are taking over, and women are so much more into that. A, I've been married for 21 years. I will say definitively, women have a much higher degree of emotional intelligence than men do on average. There's just no question about it. They're so far ahead in relationships. They're such better communicators. Uh, and they're so much more comfortable with uh, the whole care and love side of organizations. So as, as women take over, love is finally coming out of the closet in our corporate world, which is a very, very healthy thing. So love has been in the closet because people think love is fundamentally weak. That if you're loving and caring, that's great, dude. But when you get in the real world, <laughs> that's not going to work. you got to be tough. Most of the Men heroes, in, if you study American film or American literature, most of the, the male heroes are basically these real tough guys who go out and fight the bad guys. But underneath, they've got this gentle, kind side. Um, but their exterior shell is really tough. And that's been an American metaphor for a long, long time. That's going to have to change. We have got to have human beings that are fundamentally much more integrated in both their masculine and feminine sides, and both men and women. Um, <clears throat> we've, integrity. We've got to create cultures that have a great deal of integrity in them. And I mean more than just honesty. I mean that authentic, trustworthy, that uh, integrity is something that uh, uh, you don't have to be a saint to have integrity, but it's not that easy. You have to work at it. And it requires you to cultivate sort of uh, an intentionality to have integrity. And to, you can spend your whole life trying to develop integrity, and you can kind of flush it down the toilet fairly quickly by telling a few lies and spinning things and then being caught doing it. So we've got to have integrity. We've got to have, um, we've got to create organizations where loyalty is 
inherent to the organization, where a business has loyalty from its customers, it has loyalty from its team members or employees, and loyalty from its suppliers. We've got to, it's the loyalty that's the glue that holds the whole organization together ultimately. And finally, we have to create more egalitarian cultures where we're more equal. Um, Whole Foods does this in a number of ways. Uh, we have the same exact benefit structure at our company from whether you're a cashier all the way up to being a co-CEO. There's no difference in benefits. Uh, you, we've got to be more transparent about our, our pay, what people get paid. We've got to have, um, Whole Foods has a salary cap to try to, to limit uh, the too big of a discrepancy. We've got to have these cultures that really allow human beings to be in teams on a more equal basis. So my time's beginning to run down here, and I do want to save time for questions. So let me just kind of sum it up. Uh, capitalism is the greatest system that's ever existed. It's lifted humanity out of the dirt. We've become very prosperous because of it. Business is fundamentally good and heroic, and yet capitalism's disliked, business is hated, and we're losing our economic freedom in the United States. And until we can change that narrative, until business can rediscover who it is and why it exists, what its higher purpose is in the world, until it understands that it's fundamentally good and fundamentally heroic because it's creating value, not for a few, not a trickle-down value creation. There's not an inequality. The inequality in the world is primarily caused by, an by unequal access to capitalism. The best way to increase prosperity and to decrease inequality is to expand economic freedom. The whole, the whole boat lifts up with economic freedom. But business will not be loved, it will not be trusted until it embraces higher purpose, until it embraces, embraces the stakeholder principle, until we have a different type of leader that serves our organizations, and until we create cultures that fundamentally allow human beings to reach their highest potential, to self-actualize themselves, and to fully flourish in the workplaces. These are the kind of companies we've got to create. And ultimately, I'll conclude on this thought. We wrote this book primarily for the millennial generation. I'm a boomer, and I've largely given up on my generation. And other boomers don't like to hear me say this, but I find my generation's ideologically locked. It's no longer open. It's shut down. Most people have. Um, but the millennials are amazing. Their consciousness is already much higher than my generation's consciousness was at a similar age. Uh, and uh, they have the potential to truly create the conscious businesses that will transform the world in the 21st century. And the transformation the world needs will come from business. It will come from entrepreneurs. It will come from people who create organizations that are fully human, that have higher purpose, that are consciously creating value for all of its stakeholders simultaneously. This is the great potential. And so the book was written in a way to, A, give the millennials permission to do this. No, you're not stupid for doing this. You're actually really smart. Businesses that are conscious outperform in the marketplace in every, in every way, including economically. You're not stupid for doing it. And furthermore, you have permission. And if you want to win, you will ultimately create more conscious businesses because it simply works better. So we want the world to begin to create more conscious businesses. I think it's going to happen anyway because this does work better. And whatever works well in business spreads. But we think this will accelerate it. So the book is, in a way, we've written Conscious Capitalism to be an accelerant, to try to accelerate this transformation and hopefully to recapture economic freedom in America before our prosperity gets completely flushed down the toilet. All right, I think I'm done. Let's, I uh, think we're gonna queue up for questions. Where is that microphone? Uh, is it in this aisle? Somewhere there's a microphone. I can't really see. Right over here, so okay, queue up over there. And we've got 15 minutes and 28 seconds. If you're up, yeah. there's nobody ahead of you. you. Uh, good morning, John. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. My question to you is, where do you think the investment community stands in all of this? I'm actually a former Southside analyst, 
and I've spent the last three years searching and researching companies that have a greater purpose, like yourselves, Lululemon, Chipotle, LinkedIn, Starbucks, but there's not many. So There's more than you think, think because so many unknown businesses are being done consciously. There's not many as many larger companies yet. But you're asking about the financial sector. Yeah. Uh, last domino to fall. Mm -hmm. uh, Wall Street will be the last domino to fall because they, they're the purest example of the model that needs to change, that it's all, about, it's all about money. And on Wall Street, it largely is all about money. Uh, we use some examples in the book about some uh, financial organizations that we've worked with that uh, like in Whole Foods case, T. Rowe Price, the, sh the uh, sh private equity firm that invested in Whole Foods Market as well, Leonard Green, both of those organizations were very conscious in my mind. So I, I think that uh, uh, it's kind of like the book's not really written to those guys because, uh, as I say, they'll be the last domino to fall. But I do think eventually Wall Street's fundamentally agnostic. They will invest at whatever succeeds. I mean, you know what I've had at Whole Foods, what I've experienced for many years, we've been public company for 21 years. And we've, Wall Street loves us. We've created a lot of value for them. But whenever we've had one of our you know, sell-offs and a dip, uh, when the stock's going up, I like to say that, uh, that investors think they're geniuses. They're the next Warren Buffett. And when the stock goes down, they think the CEO's an utter idiot. Uh, and so, uh, Fortunately, conscious businesses perform better economically. And so Wall Street will convert. They'll start investing the money in conscious businesses because they work better. So Wall Street won't lead this, but they will follow. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, John. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I just want to ask about how you reconcile environmental responsibility with the free economy. Because as an African, I can tell you that farming in South Africa, the exports that we make are responsible for lifting a lot of people out of poverty, but then the problem is carbon emissions. So how do you reconcile the environmental impact with free economy? Well, I mean, first of all, that's a very lengthy conversation, but uh, one I'm not gonna have time to get into. I'm certainly not gonna talk about global warming up here. So I've been already gotten a lot of uh, firestorm on that one. But uh, everybody is responsible for their environmental impacts. Uh, individuals are. So you should look at your diet. You should look at your lifestyle. And then certainly organizations are. I mean, Whole Foods Market is, for example, we are very green-oriented in so many different ways. And uh, so I don't know if it's about reconciling it. I oftentimes say that, that we talk about this in the book quite a bit about uh, different kinds of intelligences. And the type of intelligence that we're trained at going through school is, is intelligence that IQ tests measure. It's what we identify as analytical intelligence. The analytical mind, it fundamentally looks for trade-offs. It looks for, well, you know, when, when, you, when you hear what I'm saying, the, the analytical mind looks for what might be wrong with it. And so the, it immediately goes to problems or conflicts and I always say, if you look for trade-offs, you can find them. But we talk about a different kind of intelligence, a systems intelligence, that's looking for the win-win-win strategies. So what we have got to create, and by the way, this is a challenge for the younger entrepreneurs here, we've got to create organizations and businesses that create value for all of its stakeholders and minimize its environmental impacts. That is the major goal, one of the major goals in the 21st century. And I can't tell you all the solutions to it, but I have great confidence in the creativity, the entrepreneurial creativity of individuals. So I think the environmental challenges will be great in the 21st century, and I have great confidence that they, basically our resources are limited on this planet, but our creativity is unlimited. There's no limit to human creativity, zero limit, there's no limitation to it. So. That's your job. You figure that one out. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Um, you, you briefly mentioned what my question was. Is I would like to hear Next. You <laughs> <laughs> a few sentences about PsyQ. 
Um, it's something I'm really interested in, and I think you coined it, if I'm not mistaken, but I love the term, and I'd like to hear you say a few more things about it. Sight, so, you mean uh, spiritual? No, systems. Systems, systems intelligence. Systems intelligence, yeah. You know, it's so important because, and it's an intelligence that most people don't have. I mean, my, most of the people that I've had arguments about with conscious capitalism, I, you know, I go argue with them about it, and then I realize, oh my God, they literally can't see what I'm saying because, because they just haven't developed a systems intelligence. They can't see how the stakeholders are all interdependent. They can't see how the organization, they can't see how it all uh, flows together. Uh, it, it requires, a, your mind has got to develop it and it, you have to train it to do so. Uh, and most of our education doesn't train it. Let me take medical school. What's the first class people take when they go to medis, uh, medical school? They, they take gross anatomy. They get a cadaver, and they spend a whole year carving up the cadaver, and supposedly they're going to learn. They're going to learn the name of this, and they're going to learn the name of that, which is all fine and well, except for one thing. It's a cadaver. It's dead. <laughs> and I'm alive. My body has 100, and tr 100 trillion cells that are all in relationship with each other. I mean, we're all complex systems. And the mind, the system's mind can see the relationships that exist between the different parts. And it's, it's an intelligence that we have to develop. We've got to have it in the 21st century because the world's become so complex. We live in this incredibly complex world. If you're going to be effective in a leader, you've got to develop your system's mind. And uh, I'm glad you're interested in it, and I hope you're developing yours. Hi, John. How are you? Thanks for the talk. My name is Rob Holzer. I'm from Matter Unlimited, and we're an agency that works uh, on brand strategy and creative communications exclusively around shared value. So I love hearing this talk. And a lot of what uh, we come up against is the data. And you mentioned that conscious companies are outperforming companies, similar companies that are not conscious companies. And we see that as well, but then a lot of the people we speak to are hungry for the data behind this, behind um, the outperformance question as well as the consumer choice questions. A lot of intentions are, I want to buy things better, I want to do those things better, but when it comes to actual sales, is, are you seeing that data and where are you seeing the best sources of data? Well, uh, in our book, that's Appendix A, so you should go to that first. Great. And, but the data is, no one's done comprehensive study on this. Right. And uh, conscious businesses do outperform. I mean, we show that, uh, I mean, over the last 15 years, the conscious business index that we developed there have outperformed the S&P 500 by 10, 10 and a half to one. So that's evidence, it's not proof. And I think that's something you ought to do. It, this is a great, we have a great need to begin to systematically measure, and because it's a skeptical, cynical world, and until people really believe that your business will outperform if it becomes more conscious, most people won't do it. Fortunately, again, we address the young entrepreneurs who aren't locked into a legacy way of thinking. They have the potential to create conscious businesses from the very beginning, and hopefully they can form a big data pool that will need to persuade a cynical, skeptical world. Great, thank you. Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm just curious how the lack of, lack of economic freedom would prevent companies from adopting a conscious mindset. How a lack of economic freedom? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't prevent them from adapting it. My argument is, is that as businesses become more conscious, then the erosion of economic freedom, see, the way I see it is economic freedom is being eroded because corporations are fundamentally not liked or trusted. So we need government to control the corporations. Who controls government is another philosophical question. In fact, that's the big question we're asking right now, is what limitations will there be on government control and power? But I know that one of the reasons we're expanding government is because businesses are not conscious, are not conscious enough, and so we need government to control, protect people from these rapacious, selfish, greedy sociopaths running amok out there. Um, so economic freedom is eroding, and as economic freedom erodes, so does our prosperity, so does our, our, our employment rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the reason I want, one of the reasons I want business to be more conscious is, is that 
then the pressure to control and regulate business will probably lessen because it won't be needed as much, or people won't feel like it's needed as much. There's always going to be bad actors. We're never going to get away from some people are going to be selfish and greedy. That's just human beings, but in every profession, they're selfish and greedy people. So uh, economic freedom eroding does not necessarily mean that you can't be conscious. Uh, it has nothing to do with it. It's, it's the reason to be conscious is so economic freedom will stop eroding because it'll, the pressures to do so will lessen. OK, thank you. I've got four minutes and 33 seconds. I don't know what happens at that point, but I think they're going to throw me out of here. <laughs> Hi, John. I first wanted to thank you for the speech and for Whole Foods. Uh, my name is Allison Cross. I started a grocery store with my brother named uh, The Boxcar Grocer. And I wanted to say that, first of all, there is a distinction between big business and just sort of large businesses, because we certainly look at Whole Foods as an inspiration and a pathway of sort of where we want to be. But do you find that the disconnect that people have with not really understanding how business functions within the community in terms of when a business flourishes, the actual community flourishes, um, and, and just like on a really basic level, uh, the more businesses in a community mean, you know, better sidewalks, mean better streets, yeah. and they actually fuel all of that. Well, Americans do have a, more of a love, have more of a love of small business, more of a love and more of a trust because they can know people on a more intimate basis. And big business is what's hardly distrusted. So, um, I mean, Whole Foods was a small business, and I think a lot of people believe, though, it's kind of like you're cute and cuddly, and then you like a cute and cuddly little bear, and then you grow into this grizzly bear that uh, goes and kills people. Uh, and it's been, not been my experience. They, in fact, Whole Foods Market, is, it's evolved. We're so much better company today than we were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And our ability to do good and to help people has been magnified tremendously by our growth and success. So the interesting idea is, why do people think when a business gets larger, that it necessarily has to become bad. People do believe that. But I'll ask, is it necessarily true? And does it have to be that way? And I, I would argue that a conscious business that, that uh, grows and evolves can be and continue to do good in our society. And of course, the book is aimed to communicate that. But uh, good luck with your business. Hello. Uh, you know, first off, I just wanted to say I really appreciate your message and will be uh, purchasing your book after hearing it. But the question that I had today was, uh, do you, did you find it difficult writing the book or delivering this message, sort of, you know, knowing that maybe your base of, uh, you know, customers, client base ha would have a different ideology than you, that, than you do? and are primarily probably the most vocal against capitalism. Yeah, no, nobody likes being hated. <laughs> and um, I have a lot of people that hate me now. So, um, but you know what, at the end of the day, a couple things. One is I'm a very authentic person. People ask me questions, I try to give truthful answers or, from my perspective on things. And I don't tend to spin things, I don't try to deceive. And then that means I do say some things that uh, sometimes people get upset, get sensationalized by journalists, and then the bloggers take it over and it just grows into, into far from what I intended or meant to say. Um, but the second thing is that, uh, and I do think we need leaders who will be authentic and who will be truthful, and I am that type of leader. And so people like me or they don't like me, but I am still the same man that I've always been, and uh, saying similar things that I've always said. And it's actually worked pretty well. I mean, Whole Foods has become very successful. Um, and so, but I had another thought to that that I've just kind of lost it. Remind oh, that's me. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Great talk. Uh, I just had one quick question. You were going through tactile, and yes. you gave. Did I leave one out? You, yeah, one T. Ah, that you was a test to see if you're paying attention. Caring, integrity, loving, egalitarian. What's the other T? Transparent. Transparent. Perfect. I will buy the book. I'm sure it's in there. Thank you very much. 
Hello, thanks for the talk today. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is John, I'm from Atlanta. Um, shop at Whole Foods, uh, Whole Foods a lot. Uh, my wife and I, I'm actually my mother-in-law. All big fans of the company. Uh, piggybacking off the question that my- Okay, it'll be the last question. So that, my friend, that my friend just said. Um, I think there's a space between being a conscious capitalist and having a business, as well as the government's role, and I think you just commented on some of the comments that you got some flack for. Did you want to add anything to that? I mean, <clears throat> things like labeling GMOs or healthcare for people that maybe a business wouldn't be responsible for, those yeah. kinds of things. There's, there's more to that, I think. Well, uh, I had more into it in the first edition of the book, and my publisher, Harvard, uh, had me cut a lot of that stuff out. And as I said, a common mistake that first-time authors do is they want to put everything they know into that first book. So they said, you gotta, you got to write another book. And so I'm working on another book called The Conscious Society, and we'll outline in that book uh, <clears throat> the three major, uh, and a good society, you're gonna have three major legs to the stool. You're gonna have the private business sector, and our book is primarily addressed to that, sec the, the, to that leg of the stool. But then you have to have a vibrant nonprofit sector. Because there are things that the, the for if, if business can make a money at it, then it really belongs in the private sector. But there's some things that society needs solved that you can't find a way to make money at it. And that's where we need a vital nonprofit sector, uh, hopefully with business partnering with it. And then there's a third sector. There are certain things that neither business nor the nonprofit sector can do, and that's what you need government to do. Plus, you need government to set the overall rules of the society to regulate and to be the, the umpire. So we're going to lay all that out in a book. Uh, called the Conscious Society. So if you like conscious capitalism, hopefully you'll like conscious society. If you don't like conscious capitalism book, you probably won't like that book either. So it'll be a, we'll continue to develop these themes. And I think we're now done. I'm gonna do a book signing if you are interested someplace Thank wherever they, that is happening. Thank you so much for coming today.